Okay, uh, anatomy students, welcome back. We are having our second bone unit video. This bone unit video is about the facial bones. Our target here, what we want you to know is that there are 14 facial bones. By the end of this, hopefully we have a clue what they are um, and key features on each of them. So let's just get right to it. All right, starting off, our first bones are the nasal bones. There are two of them. Good news, there are no features that you need to know. None, no features whatsoever. However, we do need to know where they're located, so let's take a quick look. Uh, this is a front view of the nasal bones. Notice they only make up the bridge of the nose. Just the bridge. Okay, so like really right here in the front. The front of your nose, as you notice, there's a big gap here. I could draw the rest of the nose. Ooh, that's nice. Um, it's all cartilage, mainly elastic cartilage that we're looking at here. And you can see on this little picture, these are all just cartilage. It's all flexible. So when a nose actually breaks, let's see this image. You can see a shattered nose right here. The septum is all off, skewed, and it's been pretty much shattered. Sometimes you don't actually get a break in the nasal bones. They actually just kind of fold over. And that's the case where you see in the movies where the doctor grabs nose and pops it over, and it looks really gross. Um, here's a little image. This guy, a real winner right here, looks pretty bummed. That's a definite good sign of a broken nose. That's a kind of, you know, shift it back into place kind of situation. All right. Our next type we have is the maxillae. Maxilla, if it's a single bone, notice it, the E at the end makes it sound plural. This bone actually starts out as two that then fuse together. It is the upper jaw bone. Upper jaw bone. So the feature that we need to know is something called the infraorbital foramen. And you can see this right here. Um, this is, again, site where blood vessels and nerves pass out. In fact, if the blood vessels that come out of the infraorbital foramen get popped, it's what leads to what we call a black eye. You get that big shiner underneath the eye. Um, another feature we see is something called the incisive foramen. Now to see this, you're going to have to flip your skull over. These are your front teeth right here, and this is the incisive foramen right there. Again, right behind your incisors. These are the front teeth that cut. Um, a lot of times you guys feel this guy when uh, you bite into cold ice cream. You get an ice cream headache. Uh, one of the ways people fix it is taking their thumb and pressing right behind their front teeth. That actually helps warm the blood again and kind of eliminate your headache or warm those nerves. Um, all right, next two bones. We now have the zygomatic bones. One of my favorite names. It's not, it's zygomatic. Feels like it could be in a song in Greece maybe. Um, we see the zygomatic bone is right here on the cheek. Okay, these are our cheekbones that we see on either side. Um, you can see over here the muscles that attach to the zygomatic bone. We have this big, bold muscle from the jaw, the masseter muscle. It's the one we chew with. And then we have the temporalis muscle that actually goes underneath this thing called the zygomatic arch. So let's take a look at the feature that we care about here. It's called the temporal process. The temporal process is just this portion of the zygomatic bone. Just this portion, and it connects to... If you remember, let's see if you guys remember, try it really hard here. What is the name of this feature right there? It's on the, it's on this bone. Do we know the name of this bone back here? That is called the temporal bone. And we have the zygomatic process. So the zygomatic bone has the temporal process. Together they fuse to form the zygomatic arch. This is the zygomatic arch. You can actually see a muscle travels underneath it. A couple cool things about the zygomatic arch is it can be used to kind of figure out a little bit about the uh, organism. So let's do a quick comparison here. You can see the human zygomatic arch right up here. You can kind of see some daylight in here. Uh, the bigger the arch, a good way to look at it, the stronger the bite. So compare a human up here to a dog down here. Look at the size of the zygomatic arch, the difference between them. Or over here, we can take a look at the... Right here we have a, I believe that's a badger on the left. And on the right we see a sea otter, okay? Again, just absolutely gigantic zygomatic arch. This is going to allow these huge muscles to connect to the mandible and attach to this line that you see on the top of the head of a huge muscle attachment point. Dogs also have a pretty big muscle attachment points. Humans, not so much. We actually have a pretty weak bite when it comes to other animals. 
All right, so kind of a cool little way that you can look at bones and kind of figure out really what that animal ate. Imagine if you were a, I don't know, some sort of paleontologist or some be looking at bones of some animal that you didn't know. You could probably guess what kind of animal it was or what it ate at least based on the size of this arch. Did it have to catch prey? Did it have to bite into things and crack bones open? Um, otters, of course, you know, are cracking open shellfish and stuff. They got to be pretty strong. So let's move on. So the zygomatic bone is just this little front bone. Notice dogs have a zygomatic bone, badgers, otters, and humans. We all have a zygomatic bone. Okay, moving on. Next is the lacrimal bone. Now, lacrimal bone is the smallest bone in the face. Smallest bone. The only feature that we need to notice is the lacrimal fossa. So let's let me circle the lacrimal bone. It's this little bone right here. And you can actually see the lacrimal fossa. It's this little gland, this little tunnel that makes up where your tear gland, tear duct is going to sit. Again, you can kind of see them down here as well. Uh, this uh, picture here is labeling the two lacrimal bones on either side. On our skeletons, you're going to notice that on some of them, people have taken their pencils and accidentally poked them through. So we're going to be really careful not to ruin our, our few remaining lacrimal bones that we have on our skulls in class. All right, again, it's a lacrimal bone. Lacquer literally means tears, so it's like the tear bones. Fantastic. All right, moving on, we now have the palatine bones. Palatine. You maybe hear of your palate. The palate, we have the roof of the mouth. I want you to notice there is a small little line. Do you see this little crack that's going right here? Up in front, do we remember this bone? If you do, it should be called the, um, the maxilla. Do we remember this feature up here? It's part of the maxilla. We clue, these are the incisors. This is the incisive foramen right there. So anyway, let's go back here to the palatine bones. They're in the very back of the mouth. You can see them back here as well. They're kind of highlighted. If you pulled them out of the skull, they actually, each bone is kind of an L shape. This one's another L shape. This is a front view, or a view from the back. And if you pull them out, there they are individually. So palatine bones, there's no features we need to know, but you need to know where they're located. They're in the back of the mouth, on the top there, the roof of the mouth. Now a condition that you may have heard is something called a cleft palate. All right, this is a uh, image of a baby who has a, uh, a split in the lip. You can see on the inside, you notice how the palatine bones have not fused together, as well as the maxillae did not fuse together. This surgery, this can be corrected with surgery. Um, a lot of people mistakenly think that on this actor, you guys might know Joaquin Phoenix, he has a little scar right there. That is not actually a scar from the cleft palate surgery. Uh, he just was born with a weird little scar. But this surgery is uh, pretty dang cool. I think Jessica Simpson has a cool little charity for smiles, and they take babies that are born with these horrible deformities and uh, fix it. So they look have a, kind of have like a normal life. All right. So that's palatine bones. All right. Let's take a look now at the inferior nasal conche. Okay, inferior nasal conche, there are two of these. You can notice here on the inside, they're in the nose. You've heard of nasal conche before, right? Do we remember which bone nasal conche we're on? If you remember back, it was this bone up here has a crystagalli, the cribriform plate, the perpendicular plate. This was the ethmoid bone. Well, ethmoid bone has some nasal conche that swirl the air and help filter it and increase surface area for, uh, you know, nerves for smell. There's also another bone that has the inferior nasal conche. You can kind of see how it's labeled. There's no features we need to know. We can see here on this picture, we're seeing the nasal conche. We have the superior and middle one, part of the ethmoid bone. And then down here is that inferior nasal conche. Okay. How do we find it on our skulls? The best way is you're going to look directly up the nose of your skull. You see the nasal septum right here in the middle, and then you see a nasal conche on that side and a nasal conche on that side. You see, again, two different nasal conche. You see the upper ones up here and here. These are part of the ethmoid bone up there, and then this is part of, as its own bone, the inferior nasal conche. Do we remember what this feature is right there that I'm pointing at? Try to rack your memory for that one. You should be looking at the infraorbital foramen. Infraorbital foramen, part of that, again, that maxilla. All right. Here's another great view of the nasal cavities. You can see how the nasal concha, again, this is the nasal septum right here. Whoops, go back. That's the nasal septum right here in the middle. 
and we can see the nasal conche, how they swirl the air around uh, to help us filter and warm that air. All right, next bone, second to last bone, only one, one more after this. It's called the vomer. Now the vomer is this pink bone that you see labeled on this picture here. It connects with the ethmoid bone and it also connects with that cartilage to help form something we call your nasal septum. There's just one bone, okay? We can see here again that this is the nasal septum. Sometimes the vomer gets out of place. It gets kind of cockeyed. You end up with something we call a deviated septum. Some people blame this for their snoring issues and stuff. This can be fixed. You might also notice on this picture here, do we see this round structure here on the sides? Any guesses of what that might be? That is, again, our nasal concha that we can see right there. Uh, let's take a look a little bit further here. Um, another picture, great picture of the nasal septum. Here is the cartilage, here is the ethmoid bone, and there is the vomer. Those three form the nasal septum, the thing that divides your nose into right and left halves. All right, our last bone now. Take a look now at the mandible. Okay, as we take a look at the mandible, also known as the jaw bone, it's got a few features that we need to know. Okay, this is the long, largest and strongest bone of your face. The first feature we need to know is the mental foramen. It's this little hole right there on your jawline. We also, with this, we have something else called a mandibular foramen. And to see the mandibular foramen, you're gonna actually have to look on the inside of the mandible, on the inside of the jaw, like back in here. And you can see this little hole right there on the inside. Both of these foramen are actually the sites for your dentist. When you get your teeth drilled on and you have that needle get shot in, he's gonna shove the needle right in there or in this area to kind of numb all of those nerves so that way he can drill on your teeth without you feeling the pain. Kind of a cool situation there. So he'll, he'll numb you on the front side of your jawline and he'll shove the needle in the very, very back of the inside of your jaw, way back in here somewhere to try to numb the other side. He's trying to basically angle it to hit this mandibular foramen. All right, some other features that we should know. Condylar process, condylar process. Let's take a look at the condylar process. It's this round bump on the very back of the jaw. This right here is called the ramus. Ooh, pretty cool. The ramus is this kind of, uh, this ramp that goes up to the condylar process. This is gonna articulate with that temporal bone. Do you remember the mandibular fossa that was on the temporal bone? This is what's gonna make something called the temporomandibular joint. As we move our jaw up and down, back and forth, kind of goes side to side, you can feel that joint kind of moving. Sometimes it even pops. Some people get a little bit of jaw pain right there on that uh, joint. The last feature we need to know is the coronoid process. Now the coronoid process is this sharp point right here. This is a muscle attachment point. As we look down here, take a look at this picture here at the bottom, we can see the zygomatic bone, I see the temporal bone, you see our mandible coming up, and then in this little pocket, it's all wrapped up, um, we have some ligaments holding bone to bone, they're not showing you the muscles, those muscles are the ones that go under the zygomatic arch and connect, allow us to chew our food. We have the masseter that's gonna come up to the zygomatic bone. But again, you can kinda of see a very good idea of how this all comes together. So quick practice, what would this feature be right there? Did you see I'm drawing my horrible little arrow? If you said coronoid process, you'd be correct. All right, here's a nice frontal view of the mandible. And of course, different animals have very different looking mandibles. We'll see that in class. We'll have a, a lion skull for you to check out and it's some dog skulls and pig skulls. So we'll see kind of the different structure of the mandible. All right, that is it for all the bones. Let's quickly review um, some topics. So you pit pause when you need to. First question, the nasal septum is formed by which two bones? Hit pause. If you said the vomer and perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, so it's ethmoid bone and vomer, that's what forms the nasal septum. You get a deviated septum when the vomer is not in alignment. Next question, how does a cleft palate occur? It occurs when there's not full fusion of the palatine bones and even possibly the maxillae, and you get that cleft palate. Okay, it's an easily corrected surgery. Next question. How can a paleontologist deduce an animal's diet by looking at the facial bones? Hit pause. 
All right, you gotta have to think on this one. So the size of the zygomatic arch indicates the bite strength, while the shape of the teeth indicates carnivore or herbivore. Again, a lot of information can be found out just by looking at the facial bones. So that's it. We'll be ready to look at these facial bones in class and have some uh, time with our skulls. All right, see you then.